Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started then. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, today I'm going to be taking you through a spouse client file from start to finish. And it's going to be a really open-ended session. So if you have any questions along the way, just feel free to either unmute yourself and jump in with your question, or you can send it through the Zoom chat if that's easier. So we're going to get started by adding a client. So you just go up to this Add button right at the top. And then the key things for the client are going to be first name and last name. You can put in the middle name, but it's not a required field. And then the email field, that's there if you want to send the client the online questionnaire. So you'd put in their email, you'd click this Use Questionnaire button, and then when you were ready to add the client, you'd have two options. You'd be able to send it directly from eState Planner, so the client would receive a link right from the program or you can generate a special link that you can send to the client from your own email. And that way you can sort of customize the email more and it can sort of look more like it's coming from your own firm. And then once the client receives that questionnaire link, they click on it and they're prompted to create a password just so that their information stays secure and so that they can come back into it at any time. They don't have to do it all in one sitting. And then they're able to go through and enter their profile, family tree, asset, and debt information. And anything that they put in that online questionnaire is going to automatically populate back into your system. So it can save a lot of time in the manual entry. Um, but you don't have to send them the questionnaire. So if you're not going to send it to them, if you have your own questionnaire that you like to use, or if you like to collect that information in the client meeting from them, then you don't need to worry about putting an email in and just don't click this use questionnaire box and then it won't send them anything. We're going to go ahead and add Ben. So today, since we're doing a spouse client file, we need to add both spouses as separate clients to the system and then we can link them together so that any shared family tree information, joint asset information will automatically populate in both of their profiles. And we also got the option to sync if it's going to be more of a will, uh, mirror will situation. We can sync the plan between the two. So this is only if you're doing wills for both of them. If you're just doing one of their wills and the other happens to be a beneficiary, you can just add them to the family tree later on. But this is if you're doing documents for the both of them. They need to both be added as separate clients. So we're going to go back to the Add button and we're going to add in Lauren, the spouse. So we'll say Lauren Collins. And then the key field is this spouse client field. So this is only important when you're adding the second spouse to the system. You need to add this first spouse in normally just so that their information gets into the system. And then when you're adding the second spouse, you go to this spouse client field and you pick the name of the first spouse. And that way that's going to link them together. So you can only do this when you're adding the second spouse to the system. And then you just have to decide who you're going to start with and you click on their name to go into their profile. And if you hadn't sent the client the questionnaire, or if you did but they hadn't started yet, this is what you're going to start with. So you're going to start with the client's icon and the spouse's icon. And usually what I like to do first is edit the client's information. And you can do that by just double clicking right on the client's icon. It's going to bring up more information on them. Key things that you want to make sure are filled out are first name, last name, and gender. For the client, the also known as field, this is important because it will populate in the will for the client, not for anyone else, but for the client who will. Date of birth, I usually find it easiest to just type it on the line. Let's say June 8th, 1956. And then that age will automatically populate. You can pick your country of birth. You can do citizenship or multiple citizenships. And then all of this information, this is more for information on the client to make sure you've done that adequate investigation, but it's not going to affect the will generation itself. Then you get to residency, and residency is important because however the province is set here is how the system is going to know how to calculate the probate tax, but more importantly, it's going to be how the system knows which precedents to generate. So if you're from BC or Alberta or Nova Scotia, you're going to want to make sure to change this province to your correct province to ensure that the correct precedents generate that pertain to your province. So it'll default to Ontario, but you're going to want to change that if, it's, if you're from anywhere else. The city field, let's say Ben is from Toronto. 
This will populate in the will. It'll say Ben of the city of Toronto. Special circumstances. This is a place for the client where you can note any potential capacity issues. So it's again making sure you're well protected by well documenting this stuff in case there's a will challenge down the line. You just write a description in. And then relationships is just going to tell you who they're related to on the family tree. And you can always edit the relationship if you need to. Then we'll go and save. Next, let's add a couple people to the family tree. So the way it works is you have to click on the person that you want to add to once just to get that blue circle around them. So let's say we wanted to add Ben's child. So I'm going to click once on the icon. Then I'm going to go up to child. And then whenever you're adding a child, you're always going to get this prompt as to who the other parent is. So is it Lauren Collins, the current spouse, a new parent, an ex-spouse that's going to be involved in the will, or a single parent? So there's either an ex-spouse that's not going to be involved in the will, or they're genuinely a single parent. So you've got those three options. And then you can enter the child's information. So we're going to call this child John Collins, male, say date of birth, July 19th, 2000 country Canada and then the special circumstances section for the for the client is different from the special circumstances section from everyone else on the family tree so for everyone else it's a place where you can note sort of relationship difficulties to the client estrangement to make sure you have that stuff well documented but also it's where you can note if the individual is disabled so you want to make sure that this button is checked off if they are disabled so that later on when you're creating a fully discretionary trust to that beneficiary, you want to make sure that the system recognizes they're disabled so that it'll draft a special Henson Trust clause in the will. So this is key here on the People tab. Then lastly, let's just add a grandchild to the family tree. So for grandchildren, you can't just add a grandchild directly to Ben or Lauren. What you have to do is you have to do it through direct relationships. So you have to add a child to the client, and then you have to click on the child's icon to get that blue circle around them and add a child to the child. So let's just say he's a single parent. And this is how you would get the grandchild's information in the will. Let me just add her in. Same kind of thing for nieces and nephews. You would click on the client's icon, add a sibling to the client, then you'd click on the sibling's icon and add a child to the sibling. For anybody else that's going to be involved in the will in either beneficiary or trustee capacity but doesn't fit on the family tree, you just go over to this All tab and you can add them in here. So we're just going to click that Add button. Let's say Jordy's going to be involved later on, so we're going to want to add his information in right here. And then it'll ask you about the relationship. So who is Jordy related to? He's related to Ben. What's the relationship? He's just a friend of Ben and we'll add him in. So now he's going to appear in our list of people, even though he's not family, and we'll be able to choose him as a beneficiary or a trustee later on. So that is sort of the people tab. Are there any questions here so far? Nope, okay. Well, if you do, don't be shy. Just either unmute yourself or you can send it through the Zoom chat. So the next section is assets. So this is where you're going to list all of the client's assets. And you're always going to start with the general personal effects because it will remind you to gift them to someone in the initial gift section. So you're triggering a special general personal effects clause coming up in the will so it doesn't fall into the residue. For any other assets, you can add in all the client's assets with, with all the values and give them a sense of what their state's looking like at this point in time. But for the will generation purposes itself, the only assets that you need to add in on this tab are those that are going to be specific asset requests or registered assets that you want to confirm or do new designations for in the will. So let's add a couple in. You just go up to the Add button. You pick your sort of category and then your type. We'll start with a bank account. So really for any asset that you're adding to the system, the key field is this asset name field. 
So you're going to want to change it to however you want the asset identified as. So I'm going to call it the RBC bank account and then whatever the account number is. So that way, if I'm adding bank accounts, multiple bank accounts, they're not all called bank account or bank account copy. I can actually identify what I'm planning with. And also, if it ends up being a specific asset request in the will, that's going to be how the asset's referred to, whatever you put in the asset name. Everything else is more just for information. It'll populate in the summaries, but really the key thing for the will is this asset name field. Balance, you don't have to put it in, but you can. If you do, it'll automatically calculate the probate tax for you. So let's just add this bank account in. Next, let's go for real estate, a home. So maybe they have multiple homes. Maybe this one's the family home. You can change that asset name. The address, if it's going to be um, a specific asset request in the will, this address field will populate. So you can fill that out there. Current value, let's say it's a million dollars. So you'll have this mortgage slash encumbrances field here. And if there is a mortgage on the property, you're going to want to put the value of the mortgage in the fields here. So let's say there's a $50,000 mortgage. And this is because it's good to know sort of what the debt, what asset the debt is associated with. And it also has an effect on how much probate tax is calculated on this asset. The next section we get to is debts. And there's also an option to add a mortgage in there. But best practice is if you are adding the asset that the debt is associated with, so if you're adding that property in, just put the value of the mortgage in here and don't add it as a separate debt in the debt section. You just make sure basically that you don't want to be adding it in both places. So don't add it in as a value here and as a debt in the debt section because it will double count it. So best practice, just add it in here and don't put it in the debt section. Ownership, you can do sole, joint, tenants in common. Let's say it's joint and then you just click to add the other owner and we'll click add. And because the spouse is the other owner, if we switch over to her profile, we can see that that family home has now been put into her list of assets as well. Let's go for one more. We'll do an RRSP. So again, I'm going to change the asset name to however I want it identified. The beneficiary field, this is just for information. So it's not going to affect anything. Later on, you're going to be able to choose whether you want the um, designations of the registered assets to be confirmed or to do new designations in the will. You can decide that later on. Um, but here it's just strictly for information for the summaries. Current value, let's say it's 100000 So that probate tax always automatically calculates for you, but the income tax doesn't. And this is just due to the variability of different clients' tax brackets. So usually what we do is sort of try to estimate the highest possible tax that it could incur. So for something like an RRSP, we put in like 50% of that. For an asset with a capital gain, we do like 25% of that gain, just so you're showing sort of the highest possible tax. It's just an estimate. So that's the assets tab. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay, we'll keep going. The next section is debts. So it's really more for information purposes. Uh, it's not going to affect the will generation itself. We're not going to add a mortgage because we already put it on the assets tab. But let's just say they have a credit card of $5,000. Then we're going to get to scenarios, and this is really where all of the planning occurs. And depending on your client's situation, at most, you're going to plan for each of these three scenarios so that you're covering your bases no matter what happens. So you start with surviving spouse. So this is the plan where the spouse is still around once the client's passed. Then you go to descendants only. So the spouse and the client have passed away, but there's still kids or grandkids around. And then lastly, you've got no descendants. So no spouse, no client, no kids or grandkids, like your ultimate disaster, what's happening to the estate. So we're gonna start with surviving spouse. There's two ways you can do it. So you can go through the scenario manually. So there's sort of three sections in each scenario. There's the joint designated asset section, 
where you can drag and drop assets that are joint or designated to other people so that you can show that they're falling outside of the estate. Then there's initial gifts. So this is where you're creating your specific, cash, uh, specific asset bequests and cash legacies. And then the balance, this is how you divide up the residue, either by doing it manually, by adding segments and creating gifts within the segment, or by running a macro if it's a common residue breakdown. And so you can do that, but if you're dealing with a typical client situation, there's a faster way. You just go up to this little lightning bolt button in the top corner called ePlans, and it's going to list a bunch of sort of giant macros that will go through the scenarios and appointment sections for you and create a plan according to whichever one you choose. So for example, this one says in the surviving spouse it'll give everything to the spouse. In the second scenario it'll give it to the kids in this trust and then in the last scenario it'll give half to siblings, half to spouses, siblings. And so I like this idea. Maybe I'm going to want to make some changes but this way I'll have stuff and I'm not going to start from scratch. So I'm going to run this. And so now I can see things have been done. In the joint designated assets section, it's given the um, family home, which was joint with Lauren and the designated uh, asset to Lauren. So it's showing that these two assets are falling outside of the estate. In initial gifts, it's given the general personal effects to the spouse because that's going to trigger that special general personal effects clause. And in the residue, we can click on that gray bar and then click on it again if you ever want to see the details. And it's telling us that Lauren is the beneficiary absolute 100%. There's no gift over because we don't need a gift over in this scenario because that descendants only scenario is the gift over. So we don't need to put anything here. So I don't need to make any changes to this scenario. This is what I would want to do. So I'll just go to the next scenario. So we'll go to descendants only. Nothing that's joint or designated. Initial gifts, it's given the general personal effects to the children. Let me just show you how you do it manually if you had to. So any specific asset bequest, all the assets that you've added into the system are going to appear over here. Then you just click and you drag and drop it over. You click to choose your beneficiary. So I could choose John or I could go over to classes and I could pick the class of children instead. And then it's just absolute and I will add that in. So that's how you would do that. Then the balance of the estate. So I'm going to see the details again by just clicking on the gray bar and clicking on it again. So it's going to the children in a trust 100% same trustees as executors when the beneficiary reaches age 30, that's the last stage. I want to say when they reach age 25, I'm going to change that. And then stage lump sums, I'm going to change this as well. I'm going to say at 21, I want them to get 25%. Unlimited discretion and gift over first to beneficiaries issue, then to the other children. So now I've worked off of the e-plan, but I've ultimately created the trust that I wanted to create. So it's just saved me some time from not having to start from scratch. And if I want to copy this scenario over to Lauren's descendants only scenario, I just click this spouse sync button up in the top corner. And what it's going to do is it's going to copy the residue breakdown. It's going to copy anything that's joint between the two. And it's just not going to copy solely owned assets because uh, it's not their asset to give away. So the only thing to note is when syncing, sometimes when you're going through the second spouse's profile and you're going over their planning, you might need to gift their general personal effects separately, but everything else should sync. Then lastly, you've got no descendants. So here we're just going to deal with the balance of the estate. What I could do, I could just clear and not even plan for this scenario. Maybe I have a really big family. I don't think it's ever going to get to ultimate disaster. But I do want to create a plan. I'm going to create a plan for half to Jordy and half to a charity. So I'm going to start by creating a segment for 50%. And now I have to specify what's happening to this 50%. And I do that by adding a gift. So I'm going to pick Jordy absolute 100%. This means it's 100% of the 50% that's going to Jordy. So I don't want to break down this segment even further. 
and then we can do a gift over to his issue. So now if I look at the circles, I can see of this 50%, I've dealt with 100% of it. So I don't want to add any more gifts because I've already dealt with everything in this segment. What I want to do is click, click on this gray segments button to bring me back to the main segments page where I can create my next segment for the other 50%. And then I'll add a gift. And then I'm going to do a charity. So you just go to the charities tab. And the cool thing about this is it searches right from the CRA database. So it'll find that charity with all of its information for you. I want to give it to Epilepsy Toronto. I'm going to click on that. If you click on this little eye, you can see it's got all that information with their website, their registration number, automatically pulling from the CRA database. So that's pretty cool. And then you can just add that in. And now we've dealt with 100% uh, of this 50% and therefore 100% of everything. And I can sync it over to Lauren if I want to. So that is how you do scenarios. I know that can be a lot. But does anyone have any questions in this section? No? Okay. We'll keep going then. So the next section is appointments. So this is where you're going to appoint your state trustees and your guardians. And so because we ran that e-plan, it's already made the spouse the primary state trustee. To add anyone else, we're going to go to that Add button. You can pick people. You can pick trust corporations. We're going to pick Jordy. And then you have to choose if they're going to be a primary or an ultimate. So if you set the condition as none, they'll be a primary. If you pick a condition, they'll be an ultimate. I'm going to pick if all specified cannot act. And then it's make sure the person on the specified line is correct. So it's going to say Lauren, if Lauren can't, Jordy. I can do a further alternate. Well, maybe we'll pick John. I'm going to choose the same condition, but I'm going to change the specified to Jordy. So now it's going to say Lauren, if Lauren can't act, Jordy, if Jordy can't act, John. And then you've got this little sync button up in the top corner. And this will copy the appointments over to Lauren's profile. And the last thing we're going to go over today is provisions. So there's a couple of different things here. The first is funeral arrangement. So if you want them to appear in the will, you can just type them on the line. If not, you can just get rid of this text and then there won't be a body disposition clause in the will. Include future members is if you are, it's how you define, if you want to include future members of a class in the definition of that class. So for example, if I click this children box, in the will it's gonna define children as John Collins and any other child born to or adopted by me and my spouse. Same kind of thing for class restrictions. You can restrict certain members of being part of a class. Then this is your general trust for beneficiaries under a certain age. So it's gonna guide underage beneficiaries that you haven't set up specific trust for. So like if it went up from a gift over uh, to a grandchild and they were underage, it would just follow this general clause. Secondary will assets. This is if you're doing primary and secondary, so corporate wills. Here's where you can pick and choose which definitions you want to be included in the secondary will. So potential things the secondary will could cover. And you just check the box if you want it. But if you're doing a single will, you don't have to check or end check anything. It's just not going to affect it. Then up in the corner, this first button is the undo button. So it'll undo the last thing you did. You can also redo it. So that's a new feature. Um, then we have insights. So depending on what you put in the system, these advisor insights are going to help advise you and make sure you're not missing any important planning things. So some of them will go away if you fix it. So I didn't put in a gender for Lauren. If I went back to the people tab and I changed her gender, this would go away. But some of them are always here, like this request prior wills. And it's more just, you don't have to get rid of them or anything. It's more for your reference to make sure you haven't missed any important planning considerations. And beside that is notes, where you can make any notes on your client. And then the last button is where you're going to do all your generation. So this is how you generate your documents and your summaries. So first of all, there's three summaries you can generate. 
The first one's the profile, and it's going to give you all the information that the clients filled out in their questionnaire or that you filled out for them. So all the people, all the members of the family tree, all the assets, and all the debts. And this can be good to give to the client after the planning meeting so they can sort of check over all these details and make sure spelling of names and asset information is correct. The next thing is the graphic scenario summary. So for each of the scenarios, it's going to give you a nice visual. And if you're putting in values on the assets tab when you're adding in assets, this is going to be a lot nicer because it's going to give you a sense of what's going where and stuff like that. We just got a question. Is there a way to specifically disinherit someone? So right now, um, there's going to be a deliberate exclusion of certain persons clause will persons clause will automatically generate any time you treat the children differently. So it'll do that for um, any time the system picks up on the fact that the children are being treated differently. It'll automatically generate in the draft for you. So yeah, this is the graphic one. And then the last scenario summary is the text scenario summary. And it's going to give you all the information on everything that you've put in the will. So who the estate trustees are, how you've divided up the scenario, what gifts you've created. It's like the will without the legalese. It's just got all that information. So those are the summaries. And then you can do documents. So you just click on documents. And these are all the different documents you can generate with the system. You do have to go one by one just because there's a couple of customization things after you click to generate. Uh, so we're going to do the single will today. You have to check off these two boxes. And then there's a couple things. So first, the signing date. If you want that in the will, you can, you can change the date. You can take it out and you can manually put it in the will later if you, know, if you don't know the signing date yet. Registered asset designation. This is if you want the registered assets confirmed or to do new designations in the will. Then you check, check this box. Joint designated asset confirmation. This is something that says anything that's joint is truly intended to be joint, not held on a resulting trust. Counterpart is if you're signing counterpart under the new legislation. Simplified is a shorter will with less definitions and powers. The will guide is a nice little chart at the end of the will that guides the client to the different clauses. And then a cover page is just a cover page. And for witnesses, you can pick anyone else who's a user on your account or you can pick this blank box and then you can just manually enter their information in the will. And then you would just go and click generate and then it's gonna give you a Word document that's fully editable. So you can make any changes that you want. I'll just go through it quickly. This funds and plans, this is if you click the registered asset box. Assets passing outside of the will is if you click the joint asset box. Here's definitions and interpretations. My children means John and any other child born to because I clicked the future children box on the provisions tab. Here we have our appointments, Lauren, if not Lordy, Lauren, Jordy, if not Jordy, John. Here's our funeral arrangement. Here's our special personal effects clause. So right now, if you're gifting to multiple people or a class, it's gonna come up with this red highlight because it wants you to choose whether you want the division of the personal effects to be up to the trustee's discretion or if you want to implement some sort of lottery system. So if you're just going to keep it in the discretion, you just take out or A, B, and C. You take out all three of those or you can leave them in and take out discretion. So soon this is going to be something that you can decide in the system, but for now you have to manually make that change in the document. Residue. Lauren, if not to Lauren, then this trust for the children. And then finally, half to Jordy, half to Epilepsy Toronto. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom, here's our little will guide that guides the clients to the different clauses. So that's how you'd go through it. One other thing I do want to point out is this little question mark button. So if you click on it, it's going to bring you over to our help desk where it's got lots of articles on how to do different things. It's also got courses. So if you click on courses and you go to the eState Planner certification course, this is designed to help you get to know the program better. So I would recommend doing it if you're trying to learn the program. It's a self-paced course. 
shouldn't take too much longer than an hour and you can go at it on your own pace and it's free. So I would recommend checking it out if you're trying to get to know the system better. But that about wraps it up for today. Does anyone have any final questions before we go? Nope. Okay. Well, if you do come across anything later on, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We're, we're here to help you. Uh, you can either email me directly or you can email support. Um, and we're always happy to help. Someone's asked, is there a way to get the questionnaire in hard copy? So not currently, just because um, it's an yeah, so so not currently just because it's it's an online thing. So it, it's based on what the client puts in the system. So I know some people just use their own questionnaire and then they manually put it in on their end when they're, they build out the family tree and that kind of stuff if it's a client that's not as tech savvy. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining me today, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.